Hi everyone, welcome to The Sky This Month for June 2022. My name's Paul Martinitis and this show is brought to you by the Astronomical Society of South Australia, or ASA for short. So now that we're into June, um, the start of winter, it's a really a nice time to be observing. Um, the nights are starting to get longer, we can start observing earlier. Um, the only thing really standing in our way is the awful weather that we've been having lately. Um, Nonetheless, I hope that you got to do some observing last month, um, observing some of the wonderful galaxies available in Virgo and Coma Berenices and so on. Um, this month, the galaxy viewing will continue, but we can also start to see some of the well-placed um, winter constellations starting to rise, such as um, Sagittarius and Scorpius, which we'll look at uh, shortly. And there's also um, some interesting planetary alignments going on, uh, mainly early in the morning as well. Okay, so we'll begin our sky tour as usual in the west. Um, so these constellations will be setting first in the evening. So if you want to view any objects in this region of the sky, um, you should do so as early as possible, um, soon after it gets dark. So the constellations of Argo Narvis, Carina, Vela, Puppis and Pyxis, they've been with us for quite a while. They're starting to get fairly low now, so you might want to start taking a last look um, at this region of the sky until um, next year. Uh, we also have Hydra. Hydra is the longest constellation, very long indeed. Um, in fact, it's so long that the head of Hydra is actually starting to set at the beginning of the evening, yet because it's so long, um, a lot of the objects further down its tail are actually still optimally placed um, very high in the sky. Um, so in particular, there's a few objects in Hydra besides lots of galaxies that you can take a look at. One we've looked at before, this one here is a planetary nebula, sometimes called the Ghost of Jupiter. Um, it's NGC 3242 and it's also known as Cordwell 59. Um, and I'll just show you a simulated view. So this is a simulated view um, through a 12 inch telescope uh, at quite high magnification. Um, that would be at about um, about 500 times. So remember of planetary nebula, depending on the atmospheric conditions and the size of your telescope, because they have such high surface brightness, it's always worth cranking up the magnification, maybe not to 500, but certainly in the hundreds um, to see whether you can prize out some detail. And another uh, object in Hydra uh, is M83. So this was the um, deep sky object of the month, last month for May. So I'll just zoom out a bit just to remind you of um, what that looks like. This, so this is really the jewel in the crown of the southern galaxies, I think, um, M83. Uh, so it's a face-on spiral and um, in a reasonably sized telescope under dark skies, you can actually certainly see that outer shape of the halo and you can start to perceive um, some of that spiral structure as well. Okay, let's now um, move towards the north and see what's happening there. Um, so you can see uh, Leo is now getting quite low as well, so you might want to take your last look at some of the galaxies um, in Leo, such as the Leo triplet. Coma Berenices uh, and Virgo, they're still reasonably well placed, so of course last month we talked about Macarian's chain, which is a famous chain of galaxies which kind of begins uh, in the midpoint between this star here, the, ne the nebula, and Vinda Matrix, so you've still got time to have a look at that, uh, particularly if you can get to a dark sky. Um, and you've also got Boots uh, as well, some nice objects there as well. So now let's move over to the east. So these are the constellations that are now, of course, rising as the night goes on. Um, and we're now really looking towards the center of our own galaxy. So um, just over here, in Virgo, one of the reasons we can see so many galaxies in this region of the sky, one is um, it's towards the center of our supercluster, which we belong to, but also we're looking away from the plane of our galaxy, so it's they're unobscured. But as we look towards currently towards the east, we're now really moving and looking towards the center of our galaxy. So we're getting a lot more uh, objects such as globular clusters, so you can see these circles with crosses, these are all globular clusters and, of course, a lot of open um, star clusters as well, 
planetary nebula and also bright nebula because we're now looking at um, local Milky Way objects. So in particular, um, this region of the sky here, this is where the center of our galaxy is. Um, and it's got this great big bulge in the Milky Way. So particularly if you get to a really dark sky, um, that bulge is really spectacular. So there's some really nice uh, constellations in this uh, part of the sky. Now that we're beginning winter, um, we have Sagittarius, the Archer. Uh, and I'll talk more about some of the objects in this constellation next time in July. And we also have Scorpius, uh, the Scorpion. Uh, and this all, all is one of those objects, a little bit, one of these constellations like Orion, where it actually kind of looks like what it represents. So it's um, nice and easy to pick out in the sky. So I'll just zoom in a bit on Scorpius. So you can see there, um, there will be a bright, a fairly bright red star, Antares. Near the head of the Scorpion, you've got these three stars here, which kind of form its arms and claws. And then its tail kind of wraps around, back around here to form its uh, sting. Um, now I'm actually quite frightened of scorpions, so even though it's one of my favourite constellations, I'm glad um, this one is far away in the night sky. So there's a lot of objects I could point out, but I'll just point out a few of the uh, really easy to find ones. Um, the first ones I'll point out are M6 and M7. So if you follow the pattern of Scorpius around, around to the stinger, if you look with the naked eye, you should see, even, even under a suburban sky, but particularly if you get to a bit of a darker sky, you'll see two faint glowing patches here. So they're two quite large um, open clusters, uh, M6, sometimes called the butterfly cluster, um, and also M7. So basically what I would do is, initially if you've got a pair of binoculars, point your binoculars in this direction and you'll um, easily pick them up. And I've got a certain fondness for these constellations because these clusters, because they're some of the first objects um, I ever viewed um, many years ago uh, through a, a small telescope, mainly probably because besides the Orion Nebula, they were the only objects I could find. And they, they look nice uh, under a bright city sky as well. So I'll just show you um, what those clusters look like. So there's a picture of uh, M6. Um, sometimes called the butterfly cl butterfly cluster. It's a little bit hard to see its shape because in this photo um, it shows you a lot of the background stars, but it looks even better under a telescope because you can see the bright stars and you don't see these um, background stars so much. And then we also have um, M7. Um, and this photo here generally better depicts uh, what M7 looks like. Um, it's got these lovely chains of... Um, quite quite bright um, stars in the middle. So well worth checking out uh, with binoculars or a wild, wide field eyepiece um, in your telescope. Now, while we're in this uh, region of the sky, um, I thought I might point out also that a lot of you may have seen recently um, in the news that the Event Horizon Telescope, the same collaboration of radio telescopes that took a picture of the supermassive black hole in the middle of M87, which I talked about uh, last month. Uh, re just recently, they've completed processing the data and they've managed to take a picture of the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, which is called Sagittarius A star. So Sagittarius A star is located roughly um, in this region of the sky between M6 um, and Lambda Scorpi. And I'll just quickly show you a picture of that. So that's the picture they came up with. So that's actually a depiction of the event horizon or the gas around the event horizon of the supermassive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. Um, and that, in contrast to the one in M87, this black hole is relatively small for a supermassive black hole. It has approximately uh, four million, a mass of four million suns four million times the mass of our own sun and this event horizon here is a bit bigger than the orbit of mercury so which is still large by our standards but small by by the standards of supermassive black holes um, the one in the middle of m87 i think would I, I i think if i remember correctly would actually be larger than our solar system our whole solar system um, would fit into it 
So a fascinating uh, area of the sky for sure. So while we're in this region of the sky, I'll just point out a few other uh, nice objects uh, in Scorpius. So as you follow the tail of Scorpius back um, towards the head, you'll see this very clear point, this sort of apex. Um, and if you look at this star here, Zeta Scorpi, uh, with binoculars or a telescope, if you look to the side a bit, you'll see a very a nice compact cluster of stars. So this cluster of stars uh, here is um, NGC uh, 6231, uh, and sometimes called Cordwell 76. So that's a really nice, um, well, nice region really um, in binoculars. You'll see that nice triangular arrangement of stars. And then there to the left, you'll see this uh, complex uh, star cluster. And it's also a nice object again, um, in, with a wide field eyepiece in your telescope. So I'll just show you quickly show you a picture. So that's kind of um, a professional uh, image of um, 6231. Uh, again, it's one of these nice young clusters consisting of um, some bright stars. And if you look a bit further down, if you scan, there's another really nice star cluster. So if you kind of follow a straight line, so if you imagine that this is a triangle and if you follow a line perpendicular to the base of the triangle and look for a concentration of stars here there's another really nice cluster called um, six, uh, 6268 um, and I have a friend who calls it the stingray, stingray cluster um, again a nice object in binoculars but even better in a telescope and you can see there where, where it might get the name stingray cluster it's a bit hard to see in this photo because the background stars are so bright but what you'll see is mainly these stars here and it kind of looks like a curved manta ray or stingray so that's kind of the the front of the stingray there and then you see these sort of um, tails or tentacles kind of dragging off the end um, a really nice uh, cluster you if you scan in that region with your telescope you'll certainly know it um, when you see it it's, it's quite a distinctive shape so moving now along um, the body of Scorpius um, we come to Antares so you can't miss that that's a, a deep uh, quite quite a deep red star very prominent and really quite nearby to that uh, is a nice globular cluster M4 um, so this is a nice object because it's so easy to find if you point your binoculars to Antares uh, in the same field you're sure to, um, there's a simulated image. So this is um, the field of view of a 10 by, a pair of 10 by 42 binoculars. So if, if Antares would be there, you'll see a fuzzy ball there. Um, and that's the globular cluster M4. Um, and globular clusters are really nice objects. Um, unlike galaxies and also some nebula where, you know, photos always look better, Globulars are great because, in my opinion, they actually, most of them, look better in a telescope um, than they ever do in a photo. Um, and M4 is no exception. So through a, through a telescope, say through, my, through a, an 8 to 12 inch telescope, um, you won't see as many stars as you see in this photo, but you'll certainly see a good portion of them. Um, and they'll look very fine and sparkly. You'll be able to resolve a lot of them towards the center of the cluster and M4 is distinctive as well because you might be able to see in this photograph there's kind of an intensification there or, or a, what appears to almost be a bar of light um, cutting the globular cluster and you can certainly see that in a telescope as well so uh, when you take a look at M4 um, be sure and have a look and see whether you can see that um, bar as well Okay, now let's look at the lunar calendar and dark sky time. So our last dark sky period was uh, through from the um, last part of May into the uh, beginning of June. Um, our next dark sky time when the moon won't be interfering will begin uh, around the 20th of June and grow, go through to the end of the month from the 30th and a little bit beyond. So that's a really good time to reserve for observing your fainter objects such as galaxies uh, and nebula. Um, and also get yourself to a dark sky if you can, away from the city lights. 
in between before the 20th, um, be good to reserve for observing your brighter objects, such as, um, of course, lunar observation, um, double stars, and um, also planets. So the moon phases for this month, um, first quarter is on the 8th, uh, full moon is on the 14th, last quarter is on the 21st, which is also the solstice, winter solstice, and new moon is on the 29th. So let's take a look at the solar system. Um, so this shows you the situation uh, at the beginning of the month. Um, so unfortunately, if you're like me and you're not a good morning person, um, unfortunately, the planetary viewing is all really still happening in the morning. Um, all the planets uh, are over this side of the Earth. Um, but fortunately, Saturn is starting to move its way behind. So um, at the moment, Saturn's ri rising at about 10:30 p.m. at the beginning of June and by the end of June it'll rise at 9 p.m. so um, if you want to take a look at Saturn and you don't want to get up early in the morning um, if you get up wait till later on in the month and um, say around 11 p.m. or midnight it should be quite well placed um, for observation and then of course the other planets will start to rise earlier as well as the year goes on. So I'll move forward now to um, the 12th of June. Um, so last couple of months, we've had some interesting alignments between um, Mars, Jupiter and Neptune. Uh, this month, um, Uranus uh, makes an interesting alignment. So in this case, you can see that uh, on the um, 12th of June, uh, Uranus and Venus are in line. So there'll be quite a close... Um, encounter between those two, almost a conjunction, where they'll be visible um, in the same, certainly the same binocular field, and possibly the same telescope field as well. So uh, Uranus is not a hard planet to find, but uh, if you haven't seen it before, this would be an excellent opportunity, because it's easy to find Venus, easily um, the brightest object in the sky, after the Sun and the Moon, of course, um, and on this particular time, early in the morning before sunrise. So here we're looking at about 6.40, 6 o'clock. Um, they'll be very close to one another. And also at the moment, um, it's interesting to note that all the planets are actually visible at once um, at this time of year before dawn. So if we take a look at the inner planets, you'll be able to see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, of course, uh, which is um, over here, sorry. Neptune is still quite visible as well. So you can see all of the major planets. And if you're like me and you still regard Pluto as a planet, um, Pluto is also visible. Although, of course, uh, rather hard to find because it's quite faint um, and there's a lot of stars around it as well. So great time of the year. You can do a whole um, planetary tour uh, before dawn. So we'll now just move on to the 17th, um, and this month is also an excellent opportunity um, to view Mercury. So it reaches greatest elongation on the 17th, so that's where it appears from our point of view to be the furthest away from the Sun. In this case, I think it's about 23 degrees. Um, and this is a particularly good opportunity um, because the sky is still quite dark. Um, so Mercury is rising quite high at this time, and you'll be able to observe it without um, the glare of the sun interfering. So we'll now move forward um, to the 23rd around here. And you can see that the moon has swung around um, to come into the frame. And you can see that the moon and Mars will have a close encounter on the 23rd. So that might be worth um, taking a look at as well. So this shows you what the sky will look like um, around the 12th of June um, at 6, 6 a.m., so before uh, sunrise. And like I said before, this is an opportunity where you can actually see um, all of the planets um, at the same time in the sky. So you can see starting relatively low in the sky, uh, you'll find Mercury. A little bit higher up, you'll find Venus, easily identifiable because it's certainly the brightest object in the sky besides the sun and the moon. Of course, a little bit further up, so so far they're actually going in order, um, you're going to see Mars, deep red colour, a little bit further up, 
you're going to see Jupiter. And Neptune um, will actually be a, further, a little bit further up from Jupiter. So it's still a good opportunity if you want to take a look at um, Neptune. Um, to actually locate it, you could use your star, your uh, telescope's go-to. Um, and you can also use an app such as um, Sky Safari, for example, on your phone. Uh, that's also very good for locating planet, the fainter planets, um, such as Neptune. And then moving right up again, high in the sky, so sort of you have to go overhead and then back a bit, um, you'll see Saturn. So there's all the major um, planets. And like I said um, before, Pluto uh, would also be visible um, at this time um, if you could manage to find it. So here's a close-up um, of that conjunction I talked about earlier uh, between Venus and Uranus. So they're about two degrees apart. So this shows you um, the field of view through some uh, 10 by 42 binoculars. So if you centered Venus in the middle of your binoculars, you, you could expect to see Uranus um, about a quarter of a field away, um, assuming like these binoculars are that the field of view is four degrees. So the separation here is about uh, two degrees. So while you're out too, don't forget to have a look at some of the other planets. So Jupiter, of course, um, if you take a look through your binoculars or even better your telescope, um, as usual, you see, you'll see its bands. Um, looks like the great red spot is not currently in view at this particular time. Um, and of course, you'll see at least its four brightest moons. And of course, Saturn, beautifully placed at the moment high in the sky. So not only will you see Saturn, it's a beautiful uh, ring system, which you can see now is starting to look uh, quite edge on. Uh, to us as well, um, you'll see its family of moons. So you'll see a number of these moons, depending on, on how dark your sky is and how much magnification you use. And keep a look out for Titan as well. Um, so that'll be uh, the brightest of the moons and it will have sort of an orangey uh, tinge to it. So looking a bit later, um, this is on the 17th of June. Um, so this is around about the time when um, Mercury reaches greatest elongation. So an excellent um, opportunity um, to view uh, Mercury. Um, so it's also interesting that Taurus, the bull, is still visible. So near the eye of the bull here is Outer Baron. So that's a nice red star. So you have Outer Baron here, and then you have the orangey reddish uh, Mercury. Um, above it as well. And if you take a look at the two inferior planets, uh, Mercury at this time will be a nice a little bit less than a quarter phase. So uh, if you really steady yourself, you steady your arms by using a tripod or maybe leaning against a car bonnet or something, um, with your binoculars you should be able to see um, the phase, maybe of Mercury, but certainly you'll see it of Venus, but even better if you manage to get your telescope out. So you should uh, be able to see a nice crescent uh, shaped Mercury and um, a gibbous sort of disk of Venus as well at that time. So moving along um, further now to the 23rd, um, the moon has now joined the action. It'll be a nice, nice slender crescent and there'll be kind of, and the uh, Mars and uh, moon, the moon uh, will be very close to each other. Uh, so they make a really nice sight um, in the sky. And that kind of gives you an idea of what they might look like there. So you've got the um, crescent moon and then a uh, nice bright red Mars um, next, near, next, next door. So our deep sky object for the month um, is a little bit more challenging um, than usual, usual. So this will be a good object for those of you with... Um, a reasonably large telescope, um, let's say eight inches and above. Um, and this is the uh, NGC 6334, sometimes called the Cat's Paw Nebula. So this is also found in um, Scorpius, the constellation uh, we spent some time in the time in the sky tour looking at. Um, and this is a nebula that you often see in photos. So I've shown you, I've got a photo uh, here for you to look at. So as with many of these objects, it was discovered by one of the Herschels, uh, in this case his son, uh, John Herschel, uh, in 1837. Uh, and it's about five and a half uh, thousand light years away, so quite close, uh, of course, by astronomy standards. Um, relatively bright, 
at 9.6, but bear in mind that it's spread over quite a wide area. So that size there is a roughly 35 by 20 arc minutes. So just to give you a sense of that, um, the moon is about half a degree, the full moon is about half a degree in diameter, which is 30 arc minutes. So this nebula is roughly the size of a full moon. Um, so pretty big, spread over a large area in the sky. So it comes up really nicely uh, in photographs. And in this photograph, you can actually see why it's called uh, the Cat's Paw Nebula, because you can see here it looks like the pads on, on a cat's or maybe a dog's foot. Um, and so photographically, it's a nice object, but it's really also a really nice object um, visually. Um, if you've got a reasonably large telescope um, and also with a filter. So certainly for this object, um, two things are essential. You'd have to look at it at a dark sky site um, during, the, during the window when the moon's not interfering. Uh, and also you'd need a filter such as an ultra high contrast um, or an O3. So if you, if you meet those two conditions, it's actually visually uh, quite a nice object. Um, I first viewed it probably only about four or five years ago. Uh, somebody had actually published a picture of it in the uh, in Asser's um, bulletin and it kind of intrigued me because I hadn't heard of it before um, and I'd wondered whether it would be possible to see it visually and I was actually quite surprised um, how much detail you can actually see. So through my 12 inch telescope um, I can't see a lot of the fainter stuff that you see tailing off uh, to the lower corner but I can certainly make out those three large red pads they don't look red, but, you, but I can actually see the shape of them and I can see the dark voids in between. So I can certainly see, uh, even visually, um, basically the cat's paw. So I'll just show you um, in Stellarium uh, where you can find the cat's paw. So I'll just move over towards the east. So again, this shows you the sky on the 20th of June around uh, 8 p.m. in the evening. So we're just going to zoom in again on Scorpius. Um, there's Antares, so we're just going to follow the tail of the scorpion around. And the Cat's Paw Nebula is inside the stinger in this region here. And the easiest way to imagine where it is, I'll bring up a, a Telrad circle to give you an idea. So you can see the Cat's Paw is actually there. Uh, you can see that if I zoom in. So I'll just zoom out a bit. Um, and so you can see to find it, the best way to imagine it is to there's the top of the tail, the top of the sting where there's that apex that we discussed before. Just follow it along by two stars until you get this bend in the opposite direction. And if you draw a line between that star and that star there at the end of the stinger, so you imagine a line going between those stars, follow that line up by about a third, and roughly there is where you should find uh, the Cat's Paw Nebula. And you can see also that there's this triangle of three relatively bright stars. So if you follow that line along, if you kind of can identify that triangle of uh, three bright stars in your finder scope or maybe in your Telrad, you should be in about um, the right place. Thank you everyone for uh, watching the show. I really appreciate it. I hope you found some uh, useful information in it. Um, Hopefully there'll be some nice weather um, here, even though it's getting cold in June. Um, hopefully we'll get some nice clear skies and um, I hope you enjoy um, looking at some of those objects, particularly the ones towards the center of our galaxy in uh, Scorpius and Sagittarius. So I'll talk more about some objects in that region of the sky um, in next week's show in July. So to then, uh, clear skies, uh, stay well, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.